caregiver, the invisible patient with Tracy Button, Jim Button, and Dave Kelly. Dave is a media guy, TV guy, live performance guy. <laughs> Jim was an events guy. Now he's a beer guy. Dave and Jim have been pals for over 20 years. Tracy, the caregiver and really the most important person here tonight, married Jim decades ago and has been there for all of his ups and downs. Sometimes Dave is up and sometimes Dave is down. <laughs> Welcome, Tracy, Jim, and Dave. Take it away. <laughs> yeah. okay. and, uh, and sometimes, yeah, Dave is the up and the down. Uh, hi, Tracy and Jim. And uh, I'll pick on you in just a sec, but as, as the three of us want to say is welcome to everybody. And we're aware of all the different reasons people are here. Some of you are here with a broken heart, as some of you are here with a broken body, and some of you are here with hearts full of love because you went to high school with Jim and you <laughs> can't believe that he amounted to anything. So that's one reason that we're all thrilled that you're all here. Um, so this is how we're going to work tonight. Uh, Jim and Tracy and I had a conversation. We said, I'm going to be a question guy for about 45 minutes. We're just going to get Tracy and Jim to talk about their experience, especially Tracy and her experience. And then we're going to open up the floor for questions. And uh, I can continue to keep asking questions, but especially if you're watching and you're like, I just want to know how they did or what they think of or anything like that, especially as it relates to Tracy and what it's like to be uh, the caregiver in the equation that we want you to be sure you get to ask those questions. So wherever you're at in your life and wherever you're at in your heart, we send you all the love we can and we hope you're good. And uh, this um, next hour, as Tracy and Jim and I have discussed, is for you watching and not for us. So I said, uh, I said to Tracy and Jim, why don't I sort of give the background so that they don't have to tell the story they've told lots. So in my hands, I have the Jim and Tracy background. You ready for this, you two? Yeah, I don't think sure. so. <laughs> Jim and I are, uh, Jim and Tracy and I are good friends, but just, which one's Jim again? Which, just hold up your hand. There, that's the Jim. Okay. Father's Day, uh, 2014. Jim wasn't feeling, uh, Father's Day. Hooray! Jim wasn't feeling good. Boo. So he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, we think you have appendicitis. Boo. But that's easy to fix. Hooray! We're going <laughs> to do a quick check. So they do an x-ray, and they say, yes, we can fix the appendix. Hooray! but there's a huge growth on your kidney. Boo. So a lot of people get a diagnosis of cancer. A lot of other people get a diagnosis of appendicitis. Jim Button is one of the lucky ones that got to have both at the same time. So they took it out. They said, we had surgery. We're going to take the tumor out and take the kidney with it. Hopefully everything's good. Hooray. And the appendix is fine. Hooray. Everything works out. And then uh, months later, and they said, let's go to, let's go to, I don't know, Australia, have fun, celebrate. And then months later, in April 2016, a follow-up x-ray reveals the cancer is back and it's in Jim's lungs. Uh, I got that phone call from Jim under the bridge um, by Bow Trail. It was when he called me to tell me, but uh, they went to the doctors to find this out. And he was told that statistically, he had 12 to 24 months to live and no matter how long he was alive, he would be living with this for the rest of his life. In the years that followed, they made it past the 12 months, they made it past the 24 months, but it has not been easy. It has been full of almosts, and there's been full of moments in the hospital where things didn't look good, and there's been moments in their home when things felt a lot better. Uh, it's a very complex case. 30 surgeries or procedures interact with over 70 different medical and paramedical practitioners, countless emergency room visits and hospital stays. And through it all, they've been with each other. She is his best advocate and supporter. Uh, Jim also feels lucky to have Dave Kelly by his side as his MRI guide and humorologist. I get to be a humorologist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, you two. It's good to have you. Um, how are you just checking in? How are you feeling today? I'll pick on you first, Jim. Cause I'm going to be picking on Tracy a lot. How are you feeling today? And how are you feeling about tonight, Jimmy? I'm feeling, I'm feeling good today. Feeling awesome about tonight. This is a mm -hmm. uh, big part of what I wanted to do. Once I realized I did have cancer was I wanted to, uh, share it and help those that, uh, come along behind me and give them information on what's happening, which I did through, I do through my gather with Jim blog. Mm -hmm. um, but along the way, one of the biggest things I, I've noticed is 
the lack of support and attention towards caregivers. So that's why I'm excited about tonight because I think we need more attention on the challenges that caregivers go through. Tracy, how are you feeling tonight? Great, thanks, Dave. <laughs> do you have your speech ready? Do you feel like do you feel like the valedictorian that's got to give a big speech or something? I hope you know. <laughs> no, I just feel like there's so much um, information that we've learned the hard way. Yeah. That um, you know, if there's any little tidbit that we can give to anybody that might be helpful or help ease things, um, I guess that's what I hope for is that um, some of our experience might be helpful to others. Um, so people know, I asked Tracy and Jim this, I said, if you had to give your top advice or top thoughts, what would they be? And they sent just a few. Just a, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so if you knew then what you now know now, what would you do different? Honesty is the best policy is your first heading. Let's talk a bit about that. Talk about, uh, both of your decisions, but Tracy talk about honesty being the policy you wanted to go by and what that looked like early on. Um, it, with, with our experience too, and I, and everybody responds to catastrophic news in different ways, but, um, I think from the very beginning, when I got the call from Jim, when he was at the hospital saying, oh, by the way, I do have appendicitis and he had a few other choice words in there. I also, <laughs> they also found a mass on my left kidney that they believe might be expletive cancer. <laughs> And so, I mean, you, you come to a grinding halt and it's, it is a shock to hear that. So, mm. um, I was at home with the kids and wanted very much to be at the hospital with Jim because he was going to go into surgery. And at that point, I wasn't sure if they were going to take both the kidney and the appendix at the same time. So really didn't even know what we were going into. So, um, I called my girlfriend and I said, what are you doing? And she said, um, nothing I said is there any chance you could come over because this is what I'm dealing with and I don't want to leave the kids alone because they knew Jim was feeling unwell and went to the hospital and so I I am going to share the news with them because I don't know what we're going into so my girlfriend came over and as she was coming over I sat and told the kids um dad has appendicitis but they've also discovered what they believe is a tumor on his kidney so I want to go to the hospital and be with him they're going to remove his appendix. I gave them enough information that um, I felt uh, was important at that time. And then mm. my girlfriend showed up and off I went to the hospital. And I think it's just for us been, um, you know, I didn't even have a moment to ask Jim if he felt that that was the right approach. It's just <laughs> right at the time because Jim had other things on the go at that point in time. And so um, in retrospect, in talking with our kids, just saying, what advice do you have to others in this situation? They both agreed that honesty was the best policy and that it's been um, much better for them to be aware of what's going in and to feel like they're kept up to date and in the loop. There's no guessing then. So um, that's just what we've continued to do through everything through first and second diagnosis. And I think as a helpful thing you guys did early on was uh, your blog, your WhatsApp and Facebook was a way of avoiding the 200 people who are going to call every day and say, how's it going? How's it going? Explain what you did there, Jim and Tracy. Okay. Um, we, we recognize immediately that you have to communicate with sort of your core um, social circle being family and very close friends and so we started using whatsapp as a method or i did as jim was recovering from procedures and things like that and it was just uh, you know i i got to update at once and everybody then was in the loop and it also um it prevented any misinformation from being spread which as you know can happen at times like this and then um, we have a dear friend who said to us, well, you know, for the broader circle, why don't I start a Facebook page for you? And so we came up with the name, The Button Informer, which is a family publication that Jim's dad used to do when he was alive. And so he was, um, you know, it was a nice homage mm -hmm. to him. And it was a good way of updating people and thanking people and just keeping everybody in the loop with what was going on. And then you can talk about your blog. Yeah, well, right, right off the bat, I started a blog 
main purpose was to answer those questions that you were going to get ad nauseum. Um, if someone, if I wasn't in the mood to answer, I just say go to the blog, mm -hmm. and then uh, it, so it, it ended up being quite informative. It was quite cathartic, as I found along the way. I didn't realize that I enjoyed writing. I became a creative outlet, and uh, lately, what we found that has been really positive or powerful is it's our uh, it's our historical records because <laughs> both our memories are shot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we both have brain fog. <laughs> yeah. So whenever, whenever we want to remember, when did when did we get that uh, chemotherapy? Oh, that was back in 2014, 2015, I think. Uh -huh. Let's go to the log. Yeah, so it's been very helpful. Uh, I, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Can you tell the story of the first visit to the lawyers? Because I feel like uh where one of you was taking notes and one of you may not have been and as an example of what a caregiver caregiver goes through can you tell that story tracy or uh, jim whoever yeah <laughs> tracy tell it's good yeah, my, my, my story is very different yeah well when jim got a second diagnosis we were in the oncologist uh, i'm going to give you a little back story just to get yeah. you the lawyers um when we when we learned that jim had um or that his cancer had metastasized and that there was no cure. Um, one of the final uh, statements from the doctor was, make sure you get your affairs in order. And it, I mean, that is that is really a bit like a sucker punch. You, you only see that in movies and all of a sudden it was our reality. So um, there was a bit of a scramble to, because our lawyer was no longer practicing and our wills were a bit out of date. So we did find a new lawyer through um, someone we know who mm -hmm. specializes in this area and um, made arrangements and went and met with him. And as I'm taking notes, um, Jim was just sort of sitting there. Um, he, he really not participating. And, <laughs> you know, uh, Jim and I discussed it afterwards and he said it's pretty surreal to sit there and talk about your death and talk about you know life going on when you're no longer there so meanwhile I'm I'm trying to ensure that um, our family stays whole upon Jim's demise um, and so I have a very different focus and I think that's something that we've found along the way is that we do both have very di different perspectives and different roles um, and responsibilities. And um, it's just important that we mm. are mindful that we are both coming at this from different viewpoints. Did you want to punch Jim when he wasn't <laughs> taking notes? <laughs> I don't take notes anytime, Dave. No. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. I know. But I could see, I could see, I would understand that, Tracy. You're like, you feel the weight of all this and all this responsibility. And there's like, well, you're dead. Thanks for nothing because you're not helping here. Is that, yeah. how do you, how do you kind of get your brain around that one? I, I think it's just something you have to, to accept because, mm -hmm. you know, even there's this, when, in the in the first initial period after Jim received his terminal diagnosis, there were things like I I can't ask him to go and mow the lawn if he's only got twelve months to lawn, to live. I I can't ask him to mow the lawn. Well, we, here we are six years later. <laughs> Stop mowing the lawn. He's not a big fan of shoveling locks either. <laughs> Uh -oh. It's going to oh, be one of those expose kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> this is an intervention, Jim. This has yeah. got nothing to do with caregiving. <laughs> no, but it, it is. We both have um, different things that we need to attend to. Jim really needs to attend to his health and what he requires in each day to ensure that he stays well for the next day. And mm -hmm. Um, I'm there supporting him with all those needs, but then I do have that longer consideration and we have two children. Um, and this, you know, this has been very difficult on them. Um, they've required a lot of supports and, um, we don't know, always know the answers for what they need, but it is a process in trying to figure out how to best support them. And that typically has fallen more to me, um, in this in this situation i was talking to someone about this conversation tonight and their partner uh, spouse has uh it, no they had cancer and their partner didn't and they said the challenge they find is the one who doesn't have cancer feels like because the other one's sick 
I have to be strong because the other one has moments of weakness. I have to be the one that isn't that way. And that's a lot of pressure for, in this case, you, Tracy, to say, I have to be the strong, healthy, together lead on so many things when in fact, that's, that's not very sustainable. Is that your experience? Very much so. And in, and I have found this and in, in the, the course that I took, um, Compass for the Caregiver, uh, there is that thought on many caregivers part that I'm the only one who can do this job or I can do the best job at this. And that is pretty self-limiting, particularly over a protracted period of time, because in Jim's case, we kind of break it into a, a sprint period of time, which really was the first four years where, I mean, we literally went from crisis to crisis to crisis um, to Jim going on to a medication or a treatment that had, you know, significantly better efficacy. And so we're now what we call into the marathon phase. And so, um, you know, you start worrying a little bit more about compassion fatigue and caregiver burnout. And it's important that you educate yourself as to what they are and what to look for mm -hmm. and what to do to help uh, prevent those from happening. When you talk about get your affairs in order, I, I have two follow-up questions. Um, one is how do you how do you deal with your own stress tracy about uh finances when jim's gone or how is that how does that work uh, it, that is one of my greater stressors um just that financial security so there are a number of things that play into that you know i've had to get i three years into jim's illness um I had to step back from my job. I just couldn't manage everything. And Jim was really, at that point, um, dealing with a lot of issues that required hospitalization and extended hospital stays. And then when he was at home, you know, there was, you know, things like post-procedural care and just general care that I had to do and special diets and things like that. And I just couldn't manage everything. So, mm. um, I, you know, I had to take yeah. a step back. So that was giving up my income. I've, you know, we have been very lucky in that Jim did have good insurance in place, but um, we've had um, a lot of back and forth between the insurance company and ourselves and our financial planner, who has been a godsend and happens to be a sister-in-law. Um, Jim was declined one of his... Um, insurance policies and she went to bat she's saying they can't do that because he's, mm. you know they were saying no you've got other policies and they said those were in place long before this ever came into effect and therefore you have to honor it so right. they, ended up, they ended up honoring it which is great um but we also there were because of the complexity and because jim has different policies um, they were never paying us with any regularity and the, they kept shorting us and I kept arguing with them and they said, no, we're not. And so I literally created this spreadsheet that went on for days um, with every payment, every, every detail you could possibly imagine. And so I was able to um, support the argument. So we ended up did, you know, they did pay us, but so um you know, you want to make sure you can keep yeah. the roof over your head and the lights on. And we've got two children in university and all those things. So when when Jim starts feeling unwell, that's when I get most stressed. And that's, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. When I when I spiral and I I need that reassurance. Um, you know. Yeah, it's hard. Well, and, and uh, yeah, I Jim, what is that like for you to watch that? Well, that. If there's a if if I have a stressor, that's my stress. When I start having to go in and get more surgeries or I'm not doing well, it really affects Tracy's well-being. And some of the first things she does is that that that's her stress is the financial part comes back into a into a conversation. But I think it's pretty natural, to be honest. Right? Yeah. You're, 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 you're reminded that you're facing it again. And we've had that where we're we did the sprint where we were facing it all the time. And now we've had this two year block where I've only had a few surgeries in that time. And it's, and it's been nice to be on the marathon. Speaking of the, the earlier sprint, uh, Tracy and going to the doctor the first time, lawyer for the first time, all of those things, 
One of the things that you talked about that the doctors didn't, no one ever talked to you about what grief looked like and that you Googled it and that made a difference. Would tell that story. So when, um, when we learned that they had discovered a spot on Jim's lungs. So Jim had to go um, after his kidney was removed every six months for a chest x-ray because if it did metastasize, that's where it goes. And so after... 18 months. So his third x-ray, we got word that they do see something. So all of a sudden, we'd never had to deal with an oncologist before. We just mm. dealt with a surgeon um, who had removed his kidney. And so all of a sudden, we are down, um, you know, at Tom Baker and uh, meeting with an oncologist. And as we're sitting in that meeting, he said, to Jim, okay, you know, it has metastasized. You have two options for treatments. You pick which one you want. Here's information on them. When we meet next, you'll let us know which one you want to move forward with. And you will have to be on treatment for the rest of your life. And so I'm sitting there. And meanwhile, um, they're talking about other details. And finally, at the end of the meeting, I said, I'm sorry, I just have one question I have to ask. What does the rest of your life mean? And he looked at Jim and he said, do you want to know? And then Jim paused for a minute and he thought, and he said, yes, I do. And he said, well, statistically, you've got 12 to 24 months to live. And I mean, it um, you know, we talked about this the other day. You know, it was, imp I needed that knowledge. Um, and it. Well, I think the point is, is that at that time, there was never any conversation about the impact it was going to have on you all the conversations oh absolutely me, so that you didn't even know what you're experiencing yeah so in that you know you take that away mm -hmm. and the grief is pretty significant or i didn't know it was grief at time but you know for the next 10 days we the phone's ringing off the hook you're trying to get through the day and uh carry on with your day-to-day -day existence mm -hmm. and um you know finally jim was settled somewhere kids were all, i think I can't remember where you were. Anyway, kids were off at school and I, I kept having these waves of emotion where I was just overwhelmed and I literally would have to leave the house because I didn't want to break down in front of the kids because I thought, you know, they're dealing with their own things and they don't need to see me coming unglued. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was sitting in front of the computer one day and I felt another wave and I thought I, I was just going, I don't know why I can't hold it together because I've always been good under pressure. And so I just Googled the word grief and I started reading and it was, it was almost a relief to me to discover that it's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and then subsequently I was talking to someone I know who actually is on a hospice board and she said, Oh, you're dealing with some anticipatory grief. And I'm like, well, I Googled that and read about it. And I was like, <laughs> I just, I just think in that moment when, um, I would have been so grateful if someone had come to me and said, look, uh, you know, this is a catastrophic um, diagnosis and is very impactful for you. And here are some things that you might be feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some resources here available for you. I mean, subsequently, you do find there are resources available. Um, but it, it's just such a shock in that moment. It would have been helpful um, now that said, yeah, yeah. we, we, um, have spoken with other friends we have who are in, uh, you know, particularly the partner who's in a caregiver role and, um, uh, one couple in particular, um, they received a diagnosis. It wasn't cancer, but it was another neurological degenerative diagnosis. And they were, um, the partner who's the caregiver was given a full binder of information and I think just the shock that she felt at that time she she ended up putting the binder in a drawer and and forgot about it because she was just <laughs> able to process anything at that point in time and it was only later on when she was cleaning out the drawer when she found it and she realized it had all of these amazing resources information and materials but she was in such shock that she was unable to process anything more at that time right so I think everybody responds differently um, you know, subsequently, I have found resources, but I just think you are so shocked in that moment that you just, um, you just don't function well. But understandably, but at the same time, what a, what a harsh thing to have to deal with. So there's grief, 
Talk a bit about caregiver guilt, because I know that that's something that I wouldn't have known was a thing. And you're saying, oh, yeah, it's a thing. Yeah, it is. I mean, you always feel, again, you know, that pressure to feel like you're the best person for the job, because I, I know Jim and his likes and dislikes, etc. Um, but there was an extended period of time where Jim had been in the hospital and I, he was really unwell. So I tried to be there with him as much as possible. And I mean, often I was there 12 hours a day and um, I had come home, gotten very little sleep. I was up and I sat down at the kitchen island and I was having a cup of coffee and I was just so weighed down by the guilt at that point in time, because I really felt like I should be back at the hospital with Jim. Um, and I, I subsequently learned in, a, in one of the courses, caregiving courses I took, that when it comes to caregiver guilt, question the intention. And I wish I'd known that back then because my intention at that moment was really just giving myself, I was exhausted, it was a little self-care. It was taking a moment for myself to finish a cup of coffee and just give myself a moment to breathe. Mm. Um, so the intention was really actually good and it was directed at me at that moment, but I felt so guilty because I wasn't there for Jim. So I've actually, I found that incredibly helpful advice when I do feel guilt. I just, it, it's often because I need to take a moment to care for myself. And so it helps alleviate that guilt. Guilt's a messy, guilt's a messy little emotion too. And uh, cause I get guilt. I get guilt because I've changed our family's life because of getting cancer. And Tracy Sancy, every time is, <laughs> you didn't bring this on yourself. Yeah, you didn't. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. but you still feel, still feel that guilt. It, it must be a dance for the two of you to, to not throw it at the other. I mean, not that you would, you're good people, but this is to, like for you to be sensitive, Jim, to Tracy, to say, okay, you have to stay home, have a coffee is fine, but you have to be sensitive to that, don't you? 100%. Yeah. And, and it's a dance. You know, because you can only say, can't say stay home because then the other side is, am I not helpful? Do you not need me? You know, it's, there's a balance. Well, I mean, there, there was the one. Oh, I got in trouble on this yeah. So Jim, what's that? Tell me the story. I want to hear about it. <clears throat> Jim. Um, <laughs> Way to go, dude. Was hospitalized with sepsis and he went into septic shock and, um, they, his blood pressure crashed and they were really having a very difficult time stabilizing him. And the doctor said to Jim, you know, we're oh. trying, but we can't get you out of this. You might want to call your wife. And his comment at that point was no, um, I don't want to worry her. Mm. And I found this out the next day when I arrived at the hospital, like I, I was there until trouble. about 11 o'clock at night and had mm -hmm. gone home. So it would have been like two o'clock in the morning that they would have called. And when he told me that, I'm like, <laughs> in a case like that, that's not your choice. That's my <laughs> choice. <laughs> and so I figured I'd put the pressure on the doctor to make sure I lived. <laughs> I only didn't want to give him an out. <laughs> Well, you know what? Speaking of Jim getting in trouble, tell the story of, <laughs> about what are we going to do with Jim's ashes and Jim not seeming to care a whole lot uh, in in the kindest way. Well, maybe, I don't know. I just find that an interesting, first of all, interesting conversation to have, but also how it doesn't always flow that smoothly. There are just so many things that are, you know, as Jim said, surreal that you have to deal with. You really never, I mean, we all know the ending, you know, the end of our stories, but you know, Jim is young for this type of cancer, and um, it's certainly not something that we'd, we'd ever planned to deal with. Um, so one of the things that we, you know, as part of getting your affairs in order, you know, what do you want to be done with your remains, et cetera, and Jim wanted to be cremated. And so I said to him, okay, what would you like us to do with your ashes? And he looked at me and said, I, I don't care, I'll be dead. <laughs> and I just... <laughs> He, it never makes you happy, dear. I don't, I don't think he realized, though, it was a really big burden for yeah. me because I thought, what if I put him somewhere that he hates? Mm -hmm. um, or what if there is a special spot? That, and I just, I, so I did have to go back to him and I did a lot of thought too. And I thought, okay, I think he might like this. And so I went back to him and I said, this is, this is creating a lot of stress for me. So can we talk about this? And mm. does this, you know, what do you think about this? And he said, that's great. So it, it helped me 
park that so I don't have to worry about it. That's good. Uh, we could talk about our, our funeral supper we had at some point. That's what I was but, just about to yeah. suggest, yeah. Well, yeah. So this was something Jim and Tracy, I don't know who's, who started the idea, but it was a good idea where my wife and I, Blythe and I, got together with Jim and Tracy, and all of us at the dinner had to talk about our funerals, what we want, what we didn't want, who should be there, do you want speeches, do you not want speeches, so that it wasn't well, that was, I can talk about my experience of that, but Jim and Tracy, talk a little bit about how that was helpful for you or what that was like for you guys. Well, I think, I think, I think it's something everybody should do anyway. Hmm. You know, I think it, mm -hmm. it, it seems like a hard conversation, but it can actually be, it was actually a, a beautiful evening mm -hmm. because we, we had conversations and both partners had moments where they're kind of surprised by the other person's answer on some of the things that they wanted. So I think it's uh very helpful and we, we i think the list was something like 14 or 15 questions. different questions that we had to each each answer individually and then expose them in this dinner and so i think i think that's very valuable you know it's it's a beautiful way to have a hard talk it was i found it helpful too although there was certainly the added magnifying glass of you know sitting around the table going well chances are who's going to get their wishes first yeah All right jim was the one but i would even say it was good it's good to do even if no one is sick because yeah like i just learned things that like do you want speeches do you want a reading what do you what would you want read all those sorts of questions that i think i know about blythe but i don't i didn't until then it was it's uh it was really helpful yeah. actually dave i think the, the first question you even came up with that when we sat down was who is this for i thought that was a really important yeah. question mm -hmm. Because I was off planning a really grand, like our our shows that we put on. I was he off. Was, he was selling tickets to his. <laughs> it's going to be a charity event for Wellspring. Yeah. My response yeah. to that was over my dead body. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you first. Whatever. Yeah. I got all excited. I go back to work planning something again. <laughs> yeah, but it's true, right? It's like the the downside to Jim saying, "Well, I'm not going to be around. Do whatever you want." But there's a truth to that: is the funeral isn't for Jim. It's for for a lot of other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. Speaking of people like me, good intentions all, right? Jim saying to you, hey, look, uh, it doesn't matter to me, do whatever you want, was good intended. It wasn't he was trying to pass off responsibility. And I think it's good to talk about good intentions on someone like me. If I come to you and I say, you have this terrible news or a situation happens, and I say, well, just let me know if I can help. My intention by saying that is love but that's not always helpful explain why i think many times in that moment of crisis you are so taxed and you're having to make so many you know what i'll call higher level decisions that when someone says you know let me know if you need anything number one it's very difficult to ask for help it re it is really humbling i think um we are raised, you know, at least I know I was raised to be self-sufficient mm -hmm. and, um, you know, offer help to others, but you, you're never really taught how to accept help from others. And so I, I think it was very difficult in that moment for me to come up with something and to actually ask for it. So, you know, through our experience and through, you know, things I've read and courses I've attended, it's best to identify a specific action. Like it's going to snow tomorrow. I'm going to shovel your walk or I'm going to come over and shovel your walk or I'm going to the grocery store. What do you need? You know, specific actions or I'm, you know, I'm bringing dinner <coughs> to you on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, that type of thing, identify something and say, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, they, the you still have the opportunity to say, oh, you know, it, um we've got someone doing that or whatever but it at least it doesn't put the onus on the person who who is in that position having to make so many critical decisions at that moment mm. the other thing that we learned along the way was how to accept help oh. i think we were both we're both more comfortable on giving the giving help. side mm -hmm. um, than when it came to receiving help for the longest time it took us it took a lot for us to learn so it was a learned behavior on our behalf so be conscious of that when when you're when you're dealing with somebody in that in that situation as well but it, it is so humbling and again back to that you know honesty is the best policy 
because Jim and I chose to be very open about what we were going through with Jim's health, it is amazing the support yeah. we have, like so humbling. Um, I, I just, there are so many people um, who are the reason why we're here today in the, in the condition we're in as well as we are because we have yeah. amazing support from friends and family. Um, not to pick favorites, but are there examples of things like that that people have done? Uh, I, I see a note about the green cookies, um, but is there examples of things that those of us that are watching who are just friends or potential caregivers could go, oh, I didn't know that would actually make a difference, but things that actually did make a difference for you in this journey? Well, and I, I will, I have such a vivid memory of one. I'd been at the hospital with Jim in surgery and in recovery, and there were some complications and things like that. So my girlfriend hadn't kept in touch with me. So she knew when I'd be arriving home, she texted me just before I got home saying there, there is a, a container of warm hamburger soup and fresh bread on your front doorstep. So I literally came home so drained and I got to sit down to this beautiful, warm mug of gorgeous soup and bread and just have a moment to process everything and I just it honestly was like a hug in a cup mm -hmm. um and then the the green cookie story is a fabulous one uh Jim would go through periods of time where he was uh NPO so he was not allowed to eat so and these were you know often for several days because um he was dealing with pancreatitis and there was one time when he was he was finally allowed to start eating again and he said all I want is a homemade chocolate chip cookie <laughs> but meanwhile you know I have kids in school I've got a household to run <laughs> I've got Jim in the hospital I'm like oh my god and so someone called me and she said okay I want to do something what is it and I said can you bake homemade chocolate chip cookies <laughs> and she said I'm not a great baker but I'll do it <laughs> so she baked these amazing cookies and we <laughs> We got two batches. We got regular looking chocolate chip cookies <laughs> and we got green looking chocolate chip cookies. And it was near St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and she had also had a child who had gone through um, health issues. And she said, you just need to smile. So enjoy your green chocolate chip cookies. And yeah. it just, that was so meaningful to me on so many levels because it was a wish that I really wanted to provide for Jim mm -hmm. it was a chocolate chip cookie um humor injected you know we had a good laugh as we're sitting eating green chocolate chip cookies in the hospital and I just I it was such a meaningful act in that moment I will never forget it that's so great uh I would think hearing you talk Tracy that this last few years has had moments of real loneliness is that true? Absolutely. Um, you know, again, none of our friends are dealing with anything like this. And so as, as amazing as everybody's been, they, they just don't, you know, Jim, Jim doesn't feel well often. And so my choice is to actually stay at home with him so he doesn't have to be alone. I, I sort of am driven by, I don't want to have any regrets at the end of Jim's life. I really mm -hmm. do. I you know, it's very important for me that his journey is um, as, as good as it possibly can be. And I don't want him to feel like he's not the priority because he is. Mm. Um, um, but you miss out a lot on um, social events and things like that. And then throw a global pandemic on top of it where Jim is very immunocompromised. So, you know, we've had a very quiet life for two years and um you know it gets to the point where the invitation stopped coming because you you know i had someone say to me oh we didn't invite you for new year's eve because we knew you wouldn't come and as as difficult as that it's the truth but it's mm -hmm. still hard to hear um, well and, and the other part sorry to interrupt if i am uh the other part <laughs> is it's <laughs> it, what's so funny for you no, I just a joke somebody told me once. <laughs> <laughs> if in those first years when it was the sprint and it was madness and there was always, I was always in the hospital and Tracy was always having to deal with all that and you're learning and it's all new. 
but now it's into a it's into a a long it's six years now right yeah. so you can understand why people have moved on because i've cried wolf long enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well, and I remember even talking about that with you at some point, Tracy, about how is it like you can only wake up and say goodbye, honey, for the, you know so many days in a row. But you're like, look at do you need. I said to Tracy, do you want me to come over and drive over him with a car? Because I can do that. If that would help, I'm willing to do that. Not good enough driver. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, I would just think the weight of maybe it's today. Maybe it's today. That's just that. that um, what is that experience like for you, Trace? it it it's exhausting i mean it is very taxing i'm not the same person i was um you know particularly six years ago with all of mm -hmm. this it does wear on you um no it's jim is is never out of the woods because he you know we had a a meeting with the um palliative team when they we were we thought we were nearing the end yeah and they came over and jim was at risk of a catastrophic bleed and so you have a discussion with them and their their advice at that point in time was get black towels it's less shocking and i'm sitting there going i can't even believe i'm having this conversation oh. and you know it it's always present in your mind it mm -hmm. and i i mean i do i it's it's been so lovely that he's had some stability and decent quality of life. I mean, that said, the chemo he's on does have, you know, a laundry list of side effects. So he never feels fabulous, but he's got the most amazing mindset that allows us to enjoy the best of each day. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it always is there. You do always think about it. That's I, so I know that you do things and I think people would love to hear. So things like how do you keep your head in order or meditating or what are some of the things you found if there's a, if there's an isolated, lonely, harried, exhausted caregiver watching right now, what are some of the things you've found that have helped you, whether it helps them or not? I think more recently, and I don't know if this sounds trite, I've actually learned to sit with discomfort. As mm. a human being, you will do everything you possibly can to avoid discomfort but to actually just acknowledge it and and sit with it and not try to solve it it has been very helpful for me um you know they actually have meditations on it to learning to just sit with that and and really um face that feeling um so i think that has been helpful more recently. I think when Jim's stabilized and you're not going from crisis moment to crisis moment, putting um, some structure to your week, and we are incredibly lucky in that, um, you know, even after I gave up my work, I didn't have to, we didn't have to worry about income because we did have long-term disability, which mm -hmm. allowed me to remain at home. But then I found it was very important for my own well-being to put some structure to my week. So I've actually found physical activity has been incredibly important for both of us. Mm. But I do, you know, with COVID, I do online boot camps twice a week. I do a restorative yoga program. I I was painting in person, but I've I've um, I've stopped that for the past little while with Omicron, sort of. Mm blowing through the city. Um, but those things have been really important to me, but then also Jim and I walking on a regular basis. One of the pieces of advice that Jim's oncologist gave him was, to, uh, you know, get as much exercise as you can or do as much as you can. You will, it is, you know, the best for you, you will feel better. Mm. And so Jim and I actually made a pact because the cold weather over Christmas was <laughs> very difficult you know, social isolation, cold weather, and Jim and I made a pact and we walked every day, regardless of the temperature. Um, you know, we would be, sometimes we, we would <laughs> not get out until four o'clock in the afternoon because we really dragged our heels, <laughs> but we would get out and we'd walk for an hour and we nice. would come back every day and we'd say, thank goodness we did that because we felt so much better. We kind of put Tuesdays aside as our day to do something physical. So it's, the last two Tuesdays we've gone skiing. Yeah. Which is wow. Fantastic. And then we walk um otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. 
My, my brother's line, I don't know where he got it from, but he always says, the weather always looks worse through a window. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you go outside, it's never that bad. Um, I, I want to open this up for people if they have any questions or thoughts or comments. So if you have some, think about them. Bobby's going to find a way to get to you. You can put them in the chat or she might just open it up. I don't know what sort of plan Bobby has. But maybe this would be a time too to talk about Wellspring. Uh, Tracy and Jim, both of you, to just talk about anything that you have found with the folks that are hosting this tonight that you have found helpful. I have to say, hands down, the <coughs> most helpful uh, thing I've discovered was one of the Wellspring offerings. And uh, it was with Bob Glasgow. He would do a talk and the format was so fabulous. Um, you, he always picked a topic that related to um, people dealing with cancer and caregivers. And the first one I went to was on cocooning. And so you walk in and you learn what cocooning is. And it's sort of when you, you retreat from the world and take time. And, you know, he explained why, you know, why you cocoon um, mm -hmm. and what the benefits are. Essentially, it is you can't handle any more external stressors. And so, you know, these are things where I would find moments where I, I, I could not go out. I just did not have the energy or the wherewithal to get out that front door. And it sort of helped me understand why I was feeling that way. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, you know, he would discuss further, okay, when, when does cocooning become depression and what to look for? And yeah. you know, here's, here's when you know you need to reach out if you're sort of sliding into this area. And then um, people had the opportunity to share about their experiences, which um, was immensely helpful and uh, did go to um, a, a few Great. other of his talks. And I just, I, I think the one thing for me that was so important was that educational component because I yeah. really feel knowledge is power through all of this. And, um, you know, I have a girlfriend who went to a, um, peer support group in a different country and she said I called it where hope goes to die because literally everybody filed into the room <laughs> and unloaded all of their struggles and their pain and their anguish and there was never any okay well what are we doing to help it was all <laughs> she said I, I walked to you know I walked in with my difficulties and I walked out with 12 other people too. <laughs> and she just said that was not helpful and so I just I felt um, you know, just that alone, there are so many other uh, Wellspring offerings that I urge anybody who is looking for some support or help, um, there is something there for everybody. They've just brought on the Compass for the Caregiver course, which I did four weeks, exceptional uh, curriculum and content based on research and interviews of people in caregiving positions, um, and it, it's not specific to cancer, it's caregivers in general. And um, we did the mindfulness stress-based meditation course initially. Um, we did it th through AHS, but I believe Wellspring also offers it. Mm -hmm. It's an exceptional course. And we both use meditation a great deal through this um, process. I took, uh, I took a Qigong, which is a meditative healing for movement, using movement, which was... Uh, super powerful as well there's lots again it's hard it's, it's Finance, hard. Yeah. yeah yeah there there are a lot of you know um resources to you know financial courses etc so we highly recommend you look through the offerings and we're exceptionally grateful for wellspring and all that they do i was okay for sure we're getting any questions right after this one <laughs> uh so uh, my relationship with Blythe is perfect. All we do is agree. And uh, when we're not agreeing, we're busily having frantic sex. So that's all we do for the, <laughs> all of our lives. Okay, that's not always true. So how do you, so like when, when Blythe and I have a conflict, uh, it's easy, you know, we work through it or we don't or however it happens, but we don't have cancer hanging over top of it. And people would say, oh, you must love each other more because you're, you realize the value of every day and it must just make you in love. My guess is that's bullshit at some point where it's, it's a real, it's catastrophic, as you say, 
so I feel like if there's people watching that go, it's hard for us to stay feeling together. Has there been moments like that for the two of you? Uh, no, it's been bliss. We have sex on the Sunday. Tracy is so excited that both of us are talking about our sex lives right now. Which leads to the importance of humor through situations. <laughs> Oh, but I don't mean to make light. I, I, I do it because I think it's yeah. true though, right? I can't, I remember doing a lot of work with kids with cancer and parents talking about a kid in crisis. You'd think that's going to bring us together and we're going to all be even tighter. But the amount of families that blow up because of that, because you're just not ready for the, the emotional levers that hit you all of a sudden. I will say I think it really deepened our connections. I yeah. think Jim and I have always been very good communicators. Mm -hmm. um, I think it deepened our appreciation for one another even more so. Um, I do believe a lot of the unimportant stuff that you might you know nitpick over falls sure. away initially. Um, but you know, when you're going from believing you might not have your your person there even within the next year, um I, I i just there's such a depth of gratitude gratitude for the time that you do have mm -hmm. um but i i also think more recently because you know you sort of get on with life um i do notice there are moments when jim and i aren't being the best we possibly can be with each other and yeah. so i i try and check myself and i'll and you know i will I will go to Jim and say, look, I don't think we're either being the best that we can be. So yeah. let's talk about this and can we, you know, let's both make a concerted effort because I just don't feel that going through a situation like this and. You have to make a decision whether or not you want to, you know, during that sprint, during those crazy first bunch of years, mm -hmm. there's a lot of big decisions you have to make and a lot of small decisions as well, but there's big decisions. If you're not aligned, then the chasm can become mm -hmm. quite big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate that I think the majority of those bigger things we were aligned on. But right. I can totally imagine not being aligned on, you know, I, I, I went and applied for MAID, medical assistance in dying. And uh, Tracy has always said, Jim, whatever your decision, whatever you want to do, whatever your decision is, I will support it. Um, Again, I can imagine if you didn't have that type of support, that that might be a stressful and divisive mm. moment, but we've gotten lucky that way. I also think one thing that I've learned, because this is journey, Jim's journey, and he really only knows how he's feeling in the moment. Mm -hmm. I had an ask, don't tell approach. So um, versus saying to Jim, you should do this. Mm -hmm. if, you know, I, I will ask, what do you think about trying this? Um, I just think, honestly, simple corrections in language like that make him much more receptive to hearing things. Mm. I, you know, I don't know what it feels like to be on chemo for six years. So how can I eat? All I can it's do is ride. make suggestions. <laughs> yeah, try it. Everybody go try it. It's super fun. It's do super it. Fun. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Bobby. How do you uh, how do you want to work this next section? Do you want to just read questions? Do you want yeah. to how do you want to do that? You yeah. go. I will read some questions, but before I do that, there's one thing I want to mention. Um, Wellspring Calgary supports people who have cancer and the caregiver. So you don't necessarily, if you're in a caregiving role and the person who has cancer doesn't want to be a Wellspring member, the caregiver still can. Because ah. we believe that taking care of the caregiver is so important so that they have the energy to take care of their loved one. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted everybody to know that. And sure. the caregiver can take any of the programs that we offer, not just the one specific for caregiving roles. So um, you're a good a person, couple, Bobby. There are um, a couple of comments here I'm going to read first. Okay. So such openness and honesty with a difficult topic and something that they are living currently. This is so valuable, especially how they can add in some humor with something so difficult. Yay. Um, another comment is, as a two-year caregiver, I understand so much of what you express. Thank you for your incredibly true words. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And someone also wanted to share that there's an app they use for meditation. 
It's called the Insight Timer, and it's a free app. Um, mm. I actually have that one. It's great. I would recommend it as well. Um, so one question I have is, I wonder how old your kids were when, when you were diagnosed, Jim? Let's see. It's been... They were in grade 9 and grade 11, so junior high and high school. Okay. Um, I'm so grateful for your willingness to share your journey from the start. Your sharing will help so many going through what you are experiencing. So thank you for that. Mm. Um, this conversation has been needed for so long. And I thank Jim and Tracy and Dave for sharing with us in such a loving way. My own journey as a caregiver was over three and a half years. And so much of what you have talked about resonates with me still. Oh, great. Nice. So here's a question. All right. How do you differentiate between grief and depression and when to treat either one? Ooh, that's an easy one. <laughs> yeah, very, <laughs> very bold. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I believe that um, a conversation, so we have particularly with myself and Jim and our children, we really have our, our uh, group of people we go to, our go-to people. So our family practitioner has been in a very important part of our journey. Hmm. Um, and so I would suggest that if you're questioning um, the, you know, whether or not it's grief or depression, a conversation with your family practitioner might be a good starting point. Mm -hmm. I, well, we all have accessed um, psychosocial oncology supports through Tom Baker. We've done some family counseling when we were um, struggling um, just to get through um, emerging adult issues on top of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I have aging parents that I'm supporting too. So I actually, there's another psychologist I see who has expertise in that area. It, it's, I don't think it's just um, a one, you know, in order to get the answers right. to what you, what you're worried about, I think you have to seek different um, supports um, to help sift through um, what you're experiencing. But I, I really, for us, a good starting point is always the family practitioner. It's so good. I feel like we should get the doc on as well, but you're right. Uh, Jim, how do you tell a difference? How do you know the difference between I'm sad and I'm depressed? You know, the, hard, the hardest part is the layer of the chemo really gives me fatigue, um, a brain fog, uh, joint pain, you know, so your head gets your head gets distracted with a lot of um, tough things to deal with, and yeah. you become you become sedentary to a degree. Or yeah, you have an opportunity to become um, still, and that yeah. can seem like you don't. You know, from an outside looking in, it would look like you don't want to do anything. It looks like you're, but in my head, um, I'm content sitting because it's it's quite buzzy with the chemo <laughs> drugs I have, yeah. right so um often you know tracy will quite often be um and this is where stress comes on to the caregiver she would be very concerned about me because i'm you know just staring at a wall for a while mm -hmm. and that can be seen as depression it could be me just staring at a wall and so not having an answer to that causes a lot of stress for me i i i know that the moment i start getting like that i have to get up and go do something i have to distract myself and it's beyond watching a movie or something like that it's got to be it's got to be an outside get doing something or play a game but we stop playing games because tracy always wins <laughs> that's you one think, of the advantages of think I can't or get a get a gimme every once in a while but i don't oh. <laughs> I, uh, I can say that uh, Jim with chemo brain is awesome to beat because he's not that hard to beat. Um, tell a story, Tracy, about the boots. Uh, and I asked Jim to tell okay. it and he said, well, really, that's Jim, that's Tracy's story. But it's a good one and it's a good one for caregivers. Well, when, when it's actually shoes. Uh, when Jim was 
first diagnosed, um, you know, your priorities change very quickly. Um, and you do, you're in panic mode and you're trying to figure things out and it's literally, you know, what fire is burning hottest. And so when Jim, when Jim got his terminal diagnosis, he was really in need of a new pair of shoes. And he said, I, 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 I can't buy new shoes. It's just, Why would I buy new shoes? it's just such a mm -hmm. waste. And so he really, he wouldn't buy the new shoes, but <laughs> here, here we are six years later. <laughs> Walking around barefoot. And so I, I mean, we, our kind of mantra has now been buy the damn shoes, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know what it is, whatever joy, whatever moment that you can grab out of life, please take that opportunity to do yeah. so. Um, I, I've started, um, I don't know, as you go through life, there's always like, oh, I'd really like to do that. Well, you know what? I've, I have learned from Jim's experience in that, you know what? If you want to do it, do it. Take the time. Make that a priority. Um, you know. Be intentional oh, on that. It, be very intentional of that. Because you know what? You're never going to remember the pile of laundry that you never got to. But you will remember going and skating on a lake that has frozen bubbles in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, those are the special, precious moments. And if you only have so much energy, choose to put some of it towards those moments that bring you immense joy. And 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 the intentionality is the key part. Like you can say I want to do stuff, but if you're not acting on it, time will just right. fly right by. Yeah. And and you know, kudos to Jim. There are many times when he's not feeling great, but he will make sure he gets out and does things because he knows how important that is to quality of life. Well, to be honest, if I if I didn't go out whenever I was feeling bad, I'd never leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's, that's impressive though, because I know for me, and I don't, I don't have cancer. There are days where I'm like, I'm just going to sit and, you know, having someone say, no, no, get up and go. Even having yourself, that's a good example because it's, it's good. Yeah. It's super I, helpful. I actually did a program on pain and they talk about something called uh, tending to pain. So let's say you're hiking and you scratch your leg and you think, oh, that hurts, but you just carry on. But if you have a similar experience and you look down and you recognize you're bleeding, all of a sudden you're paying more attention to it and it seems worse. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I've, I've tried to um, incorporate that into our lives. I think distraction is a really good um, uh, way mm -hmm. to help ease some of the... Um, if you keep paying attention to it, it just gets bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. And bigger. Yeah. Whereas if we can distract with, you know, again, we have to be so cautious with Jim, but Jim just celebrated a birthday um, mid-January. And, you know, one of the gifts that we gave him were movie passes. And so he and he <laughs> went with our daughter before she left for university and he went with our son before they left for university. And they found a movie theater that had no people in it. So they could actually go and safely watch a movie. But that brought them so much joy and ah. it's just finding moments like that to to do what you can buy the damn shoes yep. buy the damn shoes that's, that's awesome do you have a couple more questions dave can i go ahead and ask well we were talking but fine <laughs> <laughs> yes go <laughs> this one says hi jim what did the tom baker provide in terms of mental health and grief support well, uh, as Tracy said uh, a little bit ago, we did a meditation, mindfulness and meditation program. Um, they've got lots of services that, that they provide. Um, yeah, we went and saw two uh, they're social workers. Psychologists. Psychologists. Yeah. We've, we've gone and seen them. Well, was it a psychologist or a social worker? Yeah. Actually, it might have <laughs> been, been, it, it been one of each. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was one. Hey, I'll shut up. I'll yeah. shut up. And then you can't, so don't promise it. The so we, there's lots of programs like that. I, I at one time when you went into the Tom Baker, there was a wall of pamphlets that would mm -hmm. offer all those opportunities up. I don't know where you could find those resources. Um, they still have them, I think. Do they? Yeah. That wall, the wall of pamphlets is gone because I 
Every oh. time I'm in there, they're gone. Okay, mm. that might be a COVID thing. Yeah, it's COVID thing. I'm sure it's, I'm sure. Or but I there's got to be some available online. online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's not a good enough answer. But David. <laughs> well, but no, I mean, it was through yeah. psychosocial oncology that we did the mindfulness, yeah. stress based meditation course. And um, we have had, uh, well, actually, they have peer support groups, they have um psychologists and social workers who are all trained in yeah. supporting those living with cancer so here's a hard question for you tracy what advice do you have about being a good friend to a caregiver i appreciate the importance of volunteering household help food shoveling walks driving etc but what does it look like to be a good friend to a caregiver besides providing acts of service I think my answer would be um, giving them a little bit of your time and a little bit of space. Um, you know, one of my closest girlfriends earlier on allowed me, we were out and we drove home and sat in front of the house and she just sat next to me as I cried. She didn't need to solve anything. She was just there for me. And that was so immensely helpful in that moment. Um, and then I, I honestly think just reach out Hi, I'm thinking about you. How are you? I think with us, with our journey, um, like Jim said, you know, people do get on with their lives and um, just knowing, just getting that phone call means the world. And, and I will say um, Wellspring does an amazing job of that too. And they have peer support. Um, you know, I received phone calls from people just checking in and, you know, it, they'll even tailor phone calls to what your needs are saying, um, you know, how often would you like to continue to receive phone calls? If so, with what frequency? We don't want to overwhelm you, but we want you to know we're here. And I think mm. that is remarkable. Um, and that's a question that gets asked a lot is people are uncomfortable asking uh, on how to approach, how to approach us. And the lesson we always give is ask, you know, or, or, or let us know that you're thinking of us because if you do that, then we know that you're thinking of us and we know that you love us and you know that we are cared. Um, it's up to uh, us to kind of determine whether we're at capacity at that point and or, you know, so forget if we don't get back to you immediately, but just the thought of knowing that's, that's a powerful, mm -hmm. that's yeah. a powerful moment. I think one of the, one of also our favorite um, ways of connecting with people is going for walks. So people, I, I mean, I love it for both of us. People will call and say, let's go for a walk or text us. And it's, it's great because you're getting outside, you're getting outdoors, you're getting exercise and it gives you a chance to connect and, and catch up socially which is really lovely and there's something about it's it's like if you have a teenager and you want to have a difficult conversation go for a ride or and drive in a car or go for a walk because you're not looking at each other mm -hmm. you've got other things going on it takes that stress so for some people they're very awkward to uh enter into those conversations but by mm -hmm. doing it with a walk it eliminates a lot of the a lot of the stressors it, it it's a bit of a distraction opportunity. Well, I mean, you can talk about the weather then if that's, yeah. if that's all they're comfortable with or, you know, it, just noticing what's going on in the environment yeah. at that time of year. It yeah. really, it's a love, it, we love it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I know it's, it's harder to visit someone in the hospital or in their house. Cause then you think you're staring at them. They're just sitting there and you got to somehow, but going for a walk is like you say, it's just a way to be with somebody, but not feel that pressure. Actually, yeah. I have to tell you, we had one really fun experience in the hospital. Jim had been in for a while. We had friends show up with a picnic dinner, and this was pre-COVID. They went all out. They packed a whole picnic, and they brought the real china and everything. And Jim had been eating hospital food, as had I, for days off paper plates and things like that. And they show up, and honestly, it was hysterical because we were in a cubicle about this big. <laughs> <laughs> because we're in a quad room and we've got a curtain on this side and a curtain so everybody's bumming oops excuse me pardon me pardon. but to sit down it was a beautifully made meal and eat off real china it was such a treat and we giggled the whole time oh, so that's that a great really story good. i love I mean, that you go bobby you're doing great 
Um, so someone says, a friend who is here listening and is a caregiver, also dealing with aging parents, wants to ask you, Tracy, how do you sleep at night? What are your sleep tricks? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sheer exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I, I, I do have moments. Um, I just don't, I try not to get worked up about it if I can't sleep. Um, I, if, if it is just, yeah, getting exercise during the day regularly. Um, but I, I really work at um, not getting worked up about not sleeping. And I know that's not entirely helpful, but for me, it's better to lie there restfully for, you know, five hours than it is <laughs> to stress for five hours. Um, napping, if, if you're really exhausted, if you can squeeze a little nap in. I, my mother fractured her back and so she was living with us for five weeks this fall, all the while Jim was going, Jim had to go in for three different surgical procedures and I didn't listen to hmm. um, the fact that I, I had too much on my plate and I actually ended up in the hospital on a heart monitor for seven hours and have a follow-up visit with a cardiologist as a result. So um, it, when you can rest, take the time to do so, even if it's, you know, I was tired this afternoon, so I just took a, a minute to sit and just rest this afternoon before this evening, because I knew this was, um, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be sharp and beyond. So rest when you can. I think it's the same advice of new mothers, you know, nap when the baby's napping or nap when you're, uh, <laughs> the people you're, lo or your loved ones are, baby. are napping. Just call me baby. <laughs> I think, I think to me, the biggest, um, because quite often when I'm on steroids and really hyper, that conversion to intentionality of understanding that you are awake and not fighting it and being mad at it or stressed by it and just accepting it um, and turning it into a positive, if you can, I think mm -hmm. that's really, that's really powerful because there are going to be times when you're awake. The other part that Tracy does a magnificent job on is getting lots of exercise, which is really helpful. Right. I, I will also actually, if it's a restful night or a restless night for both of us, I actually will go sleep in the guest bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've recognized too, preserving um, as much quality sleep time as you can is really important. So prioritizing that um, is important. That's... That's, That's these are good big advice. questions. Bobby, you got some uh, good ones. What else you got? No. Well, here's, uh, here's another one. I was thinking about COVID. Has this added to your planning and stress? I know you already had a quiet life, but then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Super quiet. Jim and I keep saying it's a good thing we like each other. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, even things like, you know, Jim going out for that movie. Um, you know, there's, you know. There is a perceived risk about it, but you, I think you just choose. My, my solution to COVID was going for a walk, mm -hmm. different walk with a different person every day. And um, I was very, you know, my, my, my calendar gets booked up with walks. It's, mm -hmm. it's crazy. And so now, um, and so many people are uh, wanting to connect um, with us. The safest way to do that. And the best way to do that is, uh, is to take that daily walk and so well and actually during it. during warmer weather one of the ways that we socialized with people is we would sit outdoors everybody in their respective spots with sufficient distance between but i would make little charcuterie boards for you know the, our charcuterie and their charcuterie and it was a way to visit <laughs> and and have a little something to eat and it was She's just, awesome. <laughs> well, it was just, it was a nice way to be able to get together socially with people. Mm. That's a Thank good one. you. Um, Dave mentioned earlier the dance. I struggled with when to respect my husband's, sorry, autonomy to do what he could independently as long as he could. And when I needed to be by his side, literally, and in doing so, acknowledge my very real fear. 
So I guess that one's not a question, more of a statement. Mm -hmm. um, here's one. I was disappointed to hear about the difficulties that Tracy had with the insurance company. Suggestions. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with the not so nice people? Uh, we were we were incredibly lucky in that um, we do have an excellent financial planner again who happens to be our sister-in-law. So um, you know, go through in your insurance broker. Um, it was just so complex that I finally thought, I mean, we're you know, we can continue to go around in circles, but I need to create something that is actually going to support the argument and prove what I already knew. And so I took the time to do that, but mm. that was in concert with um, her sister-in-law who helped with some of the initial conversations and getting us connected with the right people. And we finally got a decent um, person through the insurance company who was genuinely interested in helping us solve the problem. Uh, yeah, I, the, ten, the tendency is, is to call insurance companies big, bad, mean people, and they do everything they can to protect their bottom line, um, but they're actuaries. And if you come back to them with facts and, and all the information, you can you can sway them. We've, we even went so far as to one time have conversations with, uh, with a lawyer who was a disability, who had a lot of, did a lot of work in disability law, just to, to cover ourselves, to make sure we were understanding what we had to do. But I think, first of all, you know, it's probably for most people on this call right now, it's probably too late to try and go out and get disability, but the importance and value of disability is uh, can't be mm -hmm. underestimated. Mm -hmm. But the best thing you can do is, and this is again where Tracy does an awesome job, is have all your ducks in a row. Know know the data, know the information, know everything you can. Be honest with them. Never lie. And uh, typically, if you if you've got the right stuff, you can you can convert the answer to the direction you need. Thank There's you. a good, uh, this, I just noticed the last question. That's a good one, Bobby. Do you want to read it there, Dave? Do you want me to, is it handier? Yeah. Um, it says, Tracy, how awesome is Dave Kelly? No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. Give him, an eight. <laughs> Give him a strong six. That's, that's typically where I land. So Tracy, uh, great question here. Do you ever feel angry or resentful that life is all about Jim and his health and disease? How do you deal with that? That's a great question. Yeah. It is a really good question. I don't feel anger. You know, I really feel fortunate that that is not sort of a phase that we, either of us have gone through. Um, I, I did in speaking with, um, a psychologist recently, she said, Tracy, you do have to focus on yourself and your needs um, because when you do lose Jim, that act alone is very isolating. So um, it, it's, mm. it's something I'm aware of. Um, you can really lose yourself in this process, but I feel like I've tried to do um, enough things for myself you know, particularly as Jim stabilized that um, I, I, I'm, I'm caring for myself. I, the one thing that I do find difficult is, you know, that social isolation more recently with COVID and Jim, but you know what, everybody's going through it. We just have to be incredibly cautious. We, mm. we don't take chances in that regard. Which is why as of late, we're doing the skiing and and we've always had the walks. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but it, it, I, I'll share a story with you. Um, there was a situation where there was a family dealing with cancer and it was the mother and, and she was near end of life and she was um, quite unwell at that point in time. And her husband was running the household and looking after the children and managing his work and everything. And he snapped um, saying, I'm sorry, you don't feel well, but in this moment, I have so much on my plate that I just don't want to hear about it. Mm. And, you know, he, he felt very badly for making that comment, but he was just at a point where he couldn't handle anything more. Um, and he needed to focus on himself and, um, just keeping all the balls in the air. So it, it really is a difficult, um, balancing act. Mm. 
so to me to me what i what i think is probably the biggest lesson is as early on as you can start realizing that self-care is a is a priority because it gets harder sometimes mm. and the earlier you've implemented that the better chances are that you won't get to that really frustrated angry but I think Moment. it also speaks to that caregiver guilt. I mean, you know what? Right. You feel guilty for caring for yourself. I mean, you yeah. do need to prioritize that. So if if there are certain things that you can't get to because you have to prioritize yourself, I, I strongly urge you to do that. I didn't do that, and I ended up in the hospital yeah. on a heart monitor. So. Mm -hmm. And I think guilt guilt is probably the strongest one for us, more so than anger. You know. Right. On on both sides, caregiver and patient. Wow. Um, these are light, fluffy questions, Bobby. Um, <laughs> do we, uh, I feel like I, I want to be respectful of Jim and Tracy's time as well yeah. as everyone else's. Um, do you want me to do the wrapping up speechy part? Um, before you do that, I mm -hmm. just thought, you know what, there's a really nice comment here I'd like to read. Um, and then after that, we can stop the recording and you can, well, you can do your wrapping up thing and then we'll stop the recording. Sure. But it was just so lovely written. It says, Tracy, you have my utmost, utmost respect for every version of yourself. And you have created and developed to live this life that you have been handed. The tremendous work you have done for self and family is such a short, in such a short time is to be admired. Mm -hmm. What a blessing to have, Jim. You are a tremendous encouragement and example to all us caregivers. Oh, how nice is that? Thank you. That's, that's very heartwarming and it's beautiful I think, trying to make her cry you no know, i think it was important for jim and i to take this time because if if anything like i said earlier in our experience might help others that's really what we would like it's it's a long and difficult journey and in some cases it's a short and difficult journey but if any of our experience might help others that's what we hope for it's kind of we've kind of converted one of the important things that you have to have going through stuff like this is a purpose and not working anymore. You don't have that purpose. Your kids are off at university. So that purpose has been minimized. So we have found, you know, like my original goal was to normalize um, death and dying and, and living with disease like this. Um, we noticed along the way that caregivers were, or the second patient or the invisible patient mm -hmm. so this um this this moment is is it feeds into our need to help others and gives us purpose so um in a big way it's actually a gift back to us so thank you for that well <clears throat> we're gonna charge you money it's not like we give you that gift for free yeah no appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking uh you know, I was thinking, Tracy, about all of this. I was thinking it's interesting how many times when you meet somebody on the street, they must say, how's Jim doing? And how much less times people say, how are you doing? And, uh, and I mean, it makes sense that that would be the case, but it also makes me go, I want to make sure I'm asking Tracy how she's doing more and not what's his name because he gets all the attention. Um, Jim also told me, and I'm sure the two of you told me at one point, what you learned and you alluded to it about feel the feels. And uh, and when it's shitty to just feel it and not try to fix it. And I just think you two for me have been great, uh, great examples of how to live uh, before uh, the diagnosis and since then about feeling feels and living with each other and living in the moment. And I'm I'm the luckiest guy in the world that I get to hang out with you. I feel like uh, I want to thank Wellspring for having us here. And I want to thank everyone who's watching for being here. And I wanted to give uh, Jim and Tracy the last word. You kind of said them, but I thought, you know, for the folks that are watching right now, whose hearts are a little bit broken, whose lives are a little bit afraid, who feeling a little bit of that overwhelm or a lot of all those things. If you have any final thoughts for them, Jim, and then I think Tracy gets the last word on this one. Oh, smart. Um, my mom passed away from cancer. And I remember lying, lying in bed with her and asking her questions all the time. And uh, one of the questions was, uh, what do I need to know? What are the three things I need to know? And she said, you know, um, laugh every day, uh, be nice to others, and don't take life too seriously. And I think 
I think that has helped me get through it. I think it helped. It would be, you know, it's 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 a good, it's a good three uh, sentence answer for anybody hmm. going through something like that. So, um, it's pretty tough sometimes, and it's tough. My my guilt comes from how much effort Tracy has to put into keeping keeping the family afloat, keeping me. <laughs> and he's a handful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, and uh and so uh if 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 you could just realize that huh. it's what you've got make the best of it and uh be happy with what you have mm. as much as you can tracy i i think one of the things that has helped me through this is just i don't want to live with regrets um, so I try and act accordingly. Um, there are so many resources available too. If you're feeling lonely or alone, please, um, inertia is the enemy. Don't yeah. give up. I, you know, I, often we call it failing forward. If that didn't work, try something else, reach out. Um, I, I just know when I become inert, that's when I, am concerned for myself and mm. so as as hard as it is some days to propel yourself forward or seek new supports i really urge you to do so it's um it's it's so important for your for your general well-being mm. phone a friend <laughs> and, and you know what honestly like i said with wellspring they have the breadth of offerings is so phenomenal and they have a depth of understanding about people walking this difficult journey and road um you know caregiver and patient and so uh, i'll tell the story of when you when you um are inducted into the world of cancer you don't necessarily want to be there and i knew i needed some more supports and i i had heard about wellspring so i went on the website and i thought this looks actually pretty interesting and so you know i i again i think seeking some of these supports makes it more real and you don't necessarily want that to be the case but mm -hmm. i drove to um wellspring parma house and i sat out front and i just stared at it for a while and then after staring at it for a while i actually walked in the door and bobby i don't know if you remember this but you were the one who met me and your first question was well what brought you here and uh that required a box of kleenex and a conversation in your office <laughs> but i just from you actually gave me a hug and i just thought yeah just that empathy and that openness and that here's here are our offerings and it's just as much as you don't want to be there it felt so good to be there mm. so i am forever grateful and i will never forget that act of kindness a hug means the world to someone at times like that hmm. thank you so tracy i do remember i do remember our meeting and it was special no, I am, I am forever grateful um, for your compassion in that moment when I was really, I was struggling with um, accepting the world that we had been introduced to and trying to figure out how to navigate it. It's, it has been an ongoing process. That's the other part too. It is, it's ongoing. Like it's yeah. not, <laughs> no well, thank God. <laughs> yeah, no two days. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, no two days are the same. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome.